Please be opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We'll be getting there in just a moment. I want to continue with this general study of the word of reconciliation. And it's been my custom through all of this series. I'll begin reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 17 and read through verse 20. Paul writes to the church in Corinth saying, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now you know that if we've gone through this series of studies on the word of reconciliation, that we've been basically going through the book of Acts, the book of conversions. The inspired Luke wrote that. It stands as the historical section of the New Testament following the biographical section of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And today I want us to look at how the word of reconciliation reaches the Gentiles. Now Gentiles were anybody that was not a Jew. You'll remember that in our Lord's ministry, in John chapter 10 and verse 16, that Jesus said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold, and one shepherd. Some eight years thereabouts after the Apostle Peter had presented the word of reconciliation to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, and a few, well, sometime after that, some have thought around seven years, he had confirmed its extension to the Samaritans. You remember we studied that, how he imparted Miraculous gifts to the church that was set up there by the preaching of Philip as he proved the word he preached to be from heaven and not from men by the miracle signs and wonders. We gave some time to Simon the sorcerer and what all transpired there. Then following those things, the scripture says that Peter passed through all quarters of the regions and he was abiding many days at Joppa. Now, Joppa was a seacoast town. It's about 40 miles west of Jerusalem. His home at that time was with another Simon who was a tanner by trade. Now, it helps to understand that all those houses in those days were constructed uh, somewhat different from ours today in various ways, but all of them had flat roofs, and they tended to use their flat roofs like we would a patio. They were splendid places for retirement and for prayer. And then one day Luke tells us that at the sixth hour the Apostle Peter had gone upon the housetop to pray. And while he was there he became hungry. There was a meal that was being prepared at this time. And before it was ready, Peter fell into a trance and a vision was given to him. And in that vision, he saw heaven open and a great sheet knit at the four corners, let down to the earth. Now in this sheet were all manner of animals or beasts that were unclean and clean according to what the law of Moses taught and bound upon the Jews. There was then a voice that came to Peter, and it said to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter replied, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. In other words, I have violated the law of Moses concerning what I should eat and shouldn't eat. But then the voice came again, saying, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now this was done thrice, the scripture says, three times. 
And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now let me pause here and say this. Now this is the way God chose to make it clear to the Jew that the Gentile, the uncircumcised Gentile, had a right to the gospel just as much as they did. It is very interesting to me that he chose this manner because we find Peter doubting as to what the vision meant. He knew that the vision meant something. There is a lesson here I need to learn. But he couldn't figure it out. Now let me ask you something. Why didn't God just say, Peter and all you other Jews, I love the Gentiles, Christ died for them, and I want you to preach the gospel to them. And the only answer I can give to that is, it's good sometimes people do a little thinking. And to meditate and to say, what is this? How should I be approaching this? Be that as it may, this is the way deity chose to tell the Jews the Gentiles have a right to the gospel. So while he's doubting about what this vision meant, though he knew it meant thump something, three strangers arrived at his lodging and they asked whether Simon Peter was staying there. And Still, while Peter is thinking about this vision, we find that Luke tells us the Spirit said unto him, that's Peter, Behold, three men seek thee. Then he tells Peter, Arise therefore and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Acts 10, 19, and 20. Well, he, he got up pretty quick, and he went down to the men, and he said to them, Behold... I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore you come? And they make their report to him. Because you see, the angel had already told Cornelius to send these men to Joppa, to the house of Simon the Tanner, because there was one there, Simon Peter, who had told him what they needed to know. So they said, Cornelius and Centurion, and notice how they describe his character, a just man, and one that fears God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, now watch it, and to hear words of thee. Verses 21 and 22 of Acts 10. Well, Cornelius lived in the city of Caesarea, and that too was a city on the east coast, or the east shore, I should say, of the Mediterranean Sea. And it was about 70 miles northwest from Jerusalem and about 30 miles north of Joppa. Some years ago, I visited both places. And I remember just how close it is in modern day travel because we landed very early in the morning uh, around what is Joppa, it would be then. And we got all through customs, got our bags, got all of the, on the vehicle and drove all the way into Jerusalem and have a worship. So I'd ought to tell you something about how, how close it is. Later on, we went over to that area and went up to Caesarea and saw it. And of course, in today's way of travel, it's not far at all. But of course, it wasn't, they didn't travel like we, we do today. So he, he, that is Cornelius, was a Gentile. He was not an idolater, as most all Gentiles were, as you find described in Romans chapter 1. So he was even different among the Gentiles. He had learned about God, although it doesn't indicate at all that he was a proselyte. That is, one who had chosen to live according to the law of Moses, a Gentile who had chosen to do that. No, whatsoever. You remember in, in the list of people that were gathered there on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ when the church was established in Acts 2, proselytes are mentioned. So he wasn't a proselyte. He is an uncircumcised Gentile. And yet he's one that fears God and gives alms to the people. He was, of course, a soldier. Scripture says he worshiped God. And he was a centurion which means he was roughly over 100 men. Sometimes they varied, but that's where their name came from, as a century was 100 men, so he was a centurion. <laughs> well, I said already that he was a just man. He was one who was concerned about those who didn't have what they ought to have to live. He was an almsgiver. And the Scripture says that he prayed to God always, and we learn from the record that he trained his family in the same way. That was highly unusual in those days for an uncircumcised Gentile who wasn't a proselyte. 
But we learn that from the standpoint of the gospel at this time, because it's through the gospel men are saved. You see, God has located his power to save in the gospel, Romans 1.16. Well, the New Testament has barely begun to be revealed. The church is not very old. If they lived like the Lord wanted them to in the church, then the church had to live according to the apostles' teaching. That is, inspiration was in men at this time, and the apostles bore the same relationship to the church as the New Testament does today. So Acts 2.42 says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And by the way, we do today. It's just been removed from man to a book, and we have it in the New Testament of the Christ. Such is the apostles' doctrine. So he was to hear words from the apostle Peter whereby he and all his house should be saved. Now Peter makes that statement as he recounts the events of this conversion to the Jews in Jerusalem in the next chapter, chapter 11, in this in verse 14. Well, by the direction of an angel, he had sent these three messengers that now Peter is talking to. Now I think it would be well to stop here and inquire why it was that the word of truth, the word of reconciliation, the gospel was kept from the Gentiles for several years after its offer to the Jews. Because after all, Christ had died for all men. Well, it was his purpose, as you know, in dying for all men to reconcile both, that is Jews and Gentiles, unto God in one body, by the cross, Ephesians 2 and verse 16. So why, why this delay? This may get into something a lot of times we don't realize and why Paul told Timothy to preach the word to be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. You will remember that the Jews were very exclusive. They were deeply prejudiced against everybody that was not a Jew. They were even very particular about who they associated with among the Jews. If any of them were the least bit lax, then they were very prejudiced against them. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can see all that brought out rather clearly. This prejudice had been even more intensified by their loss of nationality and their subjection to the Roman government. They chafed under that yoke, and it would finally be more than they could bear, and some 40 years later, they would rebel against Rome and be completely destroyed in the providential working of God against the unbelieving Jews. Moral forces, and this is a very important point, the reason I emphasize the long-suffering part of it, moral forces work slowly. You know, you don't just put yeast in some dough and turn around the next second and it's ready to do with what the yeast makes it to do. You have to wait for it to work. It takes time for moral changes. People are born babes into the kingdom of God and we're told to grow thereby. And different ones, according to their knowledge of the Bible and their faith coming from that knowledge, needing even to know more knowledge, grow and develop at different ways and different speeds, I guess you'd say, in order to be mature in Christ Jesus. That tells us a whole lot about long-suffering with one another, patience with one another, and being able to distinguish the difference between somebody that stopped growing and won't grow and those who are gradually growing because they're doing what they ought to and seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Prejudice, erroneous ideas, false teachings must be removed by the implantation of the truth of true principles. Folks, time is required to do this. With the prejudice of the Jews, with their limited spiritual growth, they didn't understand the nature of the Messiah, they didn't understand the nature of their own race, they didn't even understand the nature of the law of Moses, they didn't understand its temporariness, 
And they had so many customs that were contrary to the law that they were binding. And you see Jesus run into every bit of that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. With this prejudice that was the Jews, then there was limited spiritual growth. And thus, it was going to take time for their minds, even in the church, to allow for Gentiles to be accepted as brothers and sisters in Christ without some sort of, as we would say today, some big blow up in the church. And that would have greatly hindered its growth and development in this formative period. So in these years that were between the church being established in Acts 2 and the first Pentecost fall and the resurrection of Christ and the time now that we're studying, and we say roughly eight years, nobody knows exactly, but roughly that, this gave time for the disciples and the churches to grow out of their exclusiveness, to be broadened and to develop spiritually, so that when there was divine approbation for bringing the Gentiles in, there would be no further objection. Now even then, you'll see that it caused trouble in the church because among the Pharisees, according to Acts 15, they had decided you Gentiles are going to be saved by Jesus Christ, but you're going to have to be circumcised to keep the law. So a faction still arose after all this time that caused trouble in the church. Now besides all that I've said, God in His great wisdom had seen fit to commit the work of bearing his name, proclaiming his gospel, presenting the word of reconciliation to the Gentiles to a special instrument. Now, if you look at the development of the book of Acts, by this time, guess what? You've got the apostle to the Gentiles chosen, and that was Saul of Tarsus. Everything's ready. If you ever notice, sometimes we pray a whole lot about people. We want the best for them spiritually. We recognize that they may not be all they ought to be and we can't understand why they don't understand. And I've often thought about that and I wonder who's looking at me and say I can't understand why he doesn't understand what he ought to understand. And you know who I think of mostly that does that? With every one of us? is God himself. Aren't you glad that God is long-suffering and merciful to you? So at this formative stage of the church, this transition period of the Jews from the law of Moses to the gospel, before the New Testament, one book of it has been revealed, there's this time that I doubt any of us today could ever really fathom. So he called Paul to the apostleship. And for several years, Paul had been developing and schooling himself to engage in this great work. Sometimes reading through Acts, you don't realize the years had passed between these events, but they had. And Saul of Tarsus was now ready to become a tremendous factor in the extension of the borders of the kingdom of God because God never intended the church to remain with the Jews. But all this foundation had to be laid. And God, in His infinite wisdom, is working it all. Well, with that all said, let's now go back to Joppa. Peter puts these folks up for the night. And the next day, they begin their journey to where Cornelius and his house was, where they started from, and that's to Caesarea. Realizing the importance of his mission and to be prepared for an emergency, and that says so much about making preparation, the right kind of preparation, he took with him six faithful Jewish brethren. Now, he above all knew about the prejudice of the Jews. For what had he said when the Lord himself with the vision from heaven had said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. First answer to God was, I'm not going to do it. I've never violated the law of Moses. And three times he's told to do it. And he can't figure out what's being said. And it takes all this together for it to work on him. So they reach Caesarea. And it's now been about four days since the angel's visit to Cornelius. And the coming of Peter, no doubt, uh, were pressing on the mind of Cornelius. You ever thought about that? This, this man's going to come and tell you words whereby you can be saved. So I've got to wait. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do in serving God is wait. 
And this man had to wait. But he knows he's not saved. Because the man that's coming is going to tell him how to be saved. So he's having to wait these days knowing he's lost. Now we talk about anxiety in our study of the Bible and mental health on Wednesday night. You think there could be a little anxiety building up in Cornelius? He doesn't know all about these things that we do. We get to read the whole story. And we've been reading it for 2,000 years. But this is all new to him. You know, he had long been, if you want to call it this, feeling out God. He had been earnestly seeking for light concerning God and man. He didn't know a whole lot. His prayers for light were now to be answered. Now, that's rather interesting. Here's a man who's not a Christian, not even a, a Jew, and yet he prayed a prayer and God heard it. Sometimes we say, well, God won't hear a sinner's prayer. That may tell you something about Cornelius. What kind of prayer will God hear? When we say God will not hear a sinner's prayer, he's not going to hear a prayer that says, Oh, Lord, save me. I believe in Jesus, and thus I'm saved. That's the kind of prayer he won't hear. Don't you think he'd hear a prayer of a man wanting to find the truth, who's honest and begging to find the truth and asking for help to find it? You say, Well, I don't know about that. Well, then read your Bible and believe it. It says that's what happened to Cornelius. And he doesn't know anything about the scriptures like the Jews do. Not to the extent. No indication he's a proselyte. He wasn't like those idolatrous people you read of in Romans 1 for the general uh, populace of the Gentile world and a wicked bunch. So there's prayers and then there's prayers. And this prayer was answered. And what was it? You're saved the moment because you ask about it? No. This tells me that God in good providence can put the truth seeker together with the fellow that has the truth. I'm so thankful for that. Jesus has said, Knock and it will be opened unto you. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given to you. Did he mean what he said? Matthew 7, 7. Well, of course he did. But the verbs there are present tense in the Greek. And present tense in the Greek men, you never stop doing this and you'll reach the truth. Evidently, this is what this man was in his pursuit for the truth concerning his salvation. No wonder some people don't find out how to be saved. they got about as much interest in it as uh, I do in going to the moon. And I assure you, I don't have any interest in that. So God knows the hearts of men. God knows where you, what you want and what you desire and what you want out of life. So God in his wisdom and control of things that so timed the journey of the messengers... That when they, with Peter the Apostle, arrived, that he had a good audience composed of his kinsmen. Now that's interesting about Cornelius. He knows all this is happening. So what does he do? He is so sure that this will be performed, he gets an audience ready. And they're waiting on him when Peter gets there. These are family, friends, near friends, servants. They're all gathered together. So when Peter arrived, following, if you want to call it this, a natural impulse, you know, Cornelius fell down to worship him. That tells you something about him and his lack of knowledge, even of the law of Moses, regarding his approach to another man. Well, if Peter was the first pope, he sure did mess up on how popes have been acting for all these years. Because Peter forbade him to do so. Told him to get up and said, I'm a man. Truth of the matter is, Peter wasn't a pope, never has been a pope, except of men's making. Then he let him know that he had been converted, that is, Peter had been converted from this Jewish prejudice and exclusiveness. In the sense that I know that Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles, can hear the gospel and be saved just like I have been. And as we preached to all these Jews and Samaritans. Acts 10, 28 says that God had showed him, this is his own confession out of his own mouth, that he should not call any man common or unclean. Now what does that tell you about the viewpoint of the Jew and how Peter had been toward an uncircumcised Gentile? He had called him common and unclean. And as a Jew under the law, I can't have a thing in the world to do with you. But now he's learned better. Well, then Cornelius rehearses the matter of the vision. And here's what is concluded. Now, therefore, we are all here. We're all here. We're present. 
and accounted for, before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Verse 33, listen. No preacher ever had a better audience to whom to preach the gospel to than Peter did there. To be ready to hear all things that are commanded of God is a proper condition to hear the preaching of the gospel with profit to yourself. We are not to preach another sermon in the middle of this one right here, but that ought to tell us the attitude in all of us when we sit down to study the Bible or to hear the word preached. Jesus had given to Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven with power to bind and loose what had already been bound and loosed in heaven and revealed to them that we be bound and loosed on earth. Matthew 16, 19. Peter with the other apostles as the ambassadors of the court of heaven by the Holy Spirit revealed the mind of Christ concerning salvation. And Peter had, if you please, used those keys in opening the door to the kingdom, the Lord's church, to the Jews on Pentecost. And now he's doing the same thing when it comes to the uncircumcised Gentiles. The gospel hadn't changed. It's the same gospel. As he did at Pentecost, so the apostle here told, well, the wonderful story of love. The life of the Christ, the miracles that he did to prove he was the Son of God, his life up to the cruel death and then even the triumphant resurrection and his exaltation as king of kings and lord of lords. Now what's the result? Well, it can be summed up in a few words. And notice what it is. It always happens when people receive with meekness the engrafted word like Cornelius did with the intent to believe and obey it and become Christians. If you really want to be saved from your sins and be reconciled to God. First of all, they believe because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Now alluding to this occurrence sometime afterwards in the Jerusalem council, in Acts 15, Peter said, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe, Acts 15, 7. The next thing they did, Cornelius and his household, was that they repented of their sins. In recounting this to the Jews in Jerusalem, Peter said this in Acts eleven eighteen. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Do you realize that if God did not allow us to repent or receive our repentance, you could repent all day long and it wouldn't do any good. And so you see repentance is a gift, but it's something man must do. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. The third thing after hearing the word of reconciliation was that they were baptized. Now there are some people who say you don't have to be baptized to be saved. You're saved the moment you believe. There's no way you can take all of the conversion accounts of the book of Acts and see that a person is saved by faith only or faith and repentance or anything only. You cannot do it. We learned that they were baptized. But now notice what is said in Acts 10 verse 48. Peter declared, and he, or Luke wrote, and Peter declared that it was a command to be baptized in the name of the Lord and by the authority of the Lord. That he had done in Acts 2 and verse 38. He said it to believers, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He says the same thing to these people who have believed and repented here because they've heard the truth. And in hearing the truth of the gospel, the word of reconciliation, they learn the steps in God's plan of salvation. Remember, he was waiting to be able to hear all that God had commanded of him. Back up there in verse 33 of Acts 10, we read that. And now notice what's said in verse 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. My father related this to me a long time ago on the job. He was discussing with a man who he worked with as an instrument man in that shop. And they were good friends, worked together. But this man believed that one did not have to be baptized in order to be saved from his sins. He believed you were saved the moment you believed without any other acts of obedience. 
Daddy came home from work one day and he was just shaking his head. And he began to relate this to me. He said we were discussing this and I pointed out in Acts 10 verse 48 that it was a command from God that a believer who's repented from sin must be baptized. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And the response of the fellow he was studying with was, well, that's just a mere commandment. How do you answer that? If a fellow looks at a commandment from God and says it's just a mere commandment, what attitude does he have toward any commandment from God if he gets ready to disobey it or not heed it? But this man said, now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. And by the word he had been brought to belief in Christ as the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. Then he had repented of his sins by instruction, and now he was commanded to be baptized. Thus by an ambassador of the court of heaven, an ambassador for Christ to the realm of men, the word of reconciliation was made known to the uncircumcised Gentiles. And there at Cornelius and his household, the revelation gives us that they had obeyed the gospel of Christ. They complied with the conditions of the gospel and were inducted into the kingdom of God, we may say with all the rights and privileged blessings and responsibilities that go along with being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. In this case, a conversion, as in most other cases, under the ministry of the apostles, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, there was an intermingling of the ordinary and the extraordinary. We've studied about that earlier, but we need to note it here. A failure to discriminate between these, the ordinary and extraordinary, always brings about confusion. The ordinary were common in all cases of conversion to Jesus Christ. The extraordinary were as diverse as the number of conversions. In this case, there were three distinct miracles. First of all, with Peter, there was the vision of the great sheet. Then there was, on Cornelius' side of the fence, the visit of the angel to Cornelius. And then at the household of Cornelius, as Peter began to speak, there was what we will call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the only thing Peter could remember about it was it happened to them, household of Cornelius, uncircumcised Gentiles, before they were baptized, just like it happened to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. That's what he remembered. The object of the first two miracles was to get the preacher and the ones to be saved together. Now up to this time, you know that the apostles didn't understand that every creature, every creature in the word of reconciliation included uncircumcised Gentiles. Peter had actually preached it, but he didn't know what he said, which also has proved the Holy Spirit was guiding him to speak, that he had to study even what the Holy Spirit gave him to understand it. And you'll remember that on the day of Pentecost, and the promises unto you, you Jews, your children, children of Jews, and unto all them that are far off. Well, the Jews look at the Gentiles are far off. But evidently Peter was thinking of it as Jews are far off. But he had already said unto all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Acts 2 and verse 39. So God called now not only Jews and Samaritans, but uncircumcised Gentiles in the exact same way that he calls everybody else and will call them to be his servants till the end of time. And that is by the preaching of the glad tidings of Christ or the gospel. That's why Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now by the vision of the sheep, Peter was convinced that God was no respecter of persons. And therefore it is authorized by God to preach the gospel to them for their salvation as much as any Jew or Samaritan. As Peter alone saw the vision... This is important to understand. Then he alone was convinced by it. But by another miracle, the Jewish brethren, remember there were six of them, were also convinced. Cornelius was praying to know the way of salvation. The angel visited him to tell him where to find a man that could tell him what he ought to do to be saved. These two miracles, the vision of the sheet and the angel's visit, were the means, underscore that word, 
means of getting the preacher and the seeker together. The one who knew and was willing to preach, the other willing to hear, and as he said himself, to obey the commandments of God. They didn't know what they would be at this point, but we're ready to do it. The sixth Jewish brethren who went with Peter weren't all that convinced because they had nothing to convince them. Except they trusted to go with uh, Peter. He's the one who invited them. But there's something that did convince them. And it didn't involve a man putting his stamp on things by power of the Holy Spirit. God directly from heaven poured out his Holy Spirit and said, This is God's business. And you folks can see it. And without even using the agency of man, he said, Gentiles have a right to the gospel. This was the means of removing the objections that the Jews had. And when rehearsed by Peter and confirmed by these brethren back in Jerusalem, which they did in Acts 11, and if you'll notice Luke mentions that Peter said he would rehearse these things by order. Sometimes I just go to chapter 11 and preach what happened in chapter 10 because it's preached exactly by order. You can almost number it if you go to chapter 11. And since the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to record it, the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to originally give it, you can't get better than that, folks. So, this was the remains of removing the objections of the other, the six other Jewish brethren, Acts 11, 17, and 18. It also bore witness to the Gentiles. Sometimes we don't think of this. That they were entitled to the privileges of the gospel. Do you realize that any Gentile could walk up to Cornelius after his conversion and say, but you're a Gentile. Jews don't do that, but I can tell you God put his personal stamp on it, and the apostle of Christ said it was so because God put his personal stamp on that, and six Jews were there to witness what happened at my house. I have a right to the gospel. Any Jew could rise up anywhere that was a member of the church, and the same thing could be said to them. Acts 15 and verse 8, that's exactly what happened when they all went down to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, to find out where is this doctrine coming from that's troubled the church, a Gentile church, in Antioch of Syria that says Gentiles can be saved by Christ, but they must be circumcised, keep the law, do it. So they had a big deal down there in Jerusalem. Not to determine what the truth was, but where is this coming from in the church? Brethren, not all tell us sometimes, but you have to find out who's doing what. And there's divine direction to do it. There are but two cases of the baptism of the Holy Ghost on record. One was at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. When Peter used the keys and admitted Jews in the kingdom. The other was, as I say, roughly eight years later at the household of Cornelius. Showing that the Gentiles have a right to the gospel. God is no respecter of persons. Making difference how rich, how poor, male or female, whatever your ethnic background, whatever. You still have to believe and obey the same gospel to be saved. On the day of Pentecost, those who had been disciples for around three and a half years were the subjects of it. That is, Holy Spirit baptism. That is, the apostles. It was to endure, endure them with power so they could be what God called them to do through Jesus Christ, the ambassadors of the court of heaven. They were to be qualified ambassadors as we've studied. At the house of Cornelius, this action directly from God on unsaved persons who Jews didn't believe had a right to be saved made it clear that God says they do have a right. And you have no right as Jews to forbid it. And you must preach the gospel of them as well as anybody else. To have them saved by it is to have them saved without faith and without purified hearts. That is saved by Holy Spirit baptism. Which some people teach that's what happens. The Holy Spirit comes directly upon you independent of any means and saves a person. There's no record of that in the Bible. That is the figment of men's fermented imagination. The outpouring took place as Peter, notice, began to speak, Acts eleven fifteen, And guess where their faith was? Well, it was in God, in His Word, and it was at the result of Peter preaching His Word, Acts 15, 7. Now, what we're seeing as we close the lesson is that the Gentiles' hearts, as was the Jews, and as anybody today and until the end of time, is purified, forgiven of sins, as a result of of their faith rendering obedience to the commandments of God, verse 9. Now, a theory that forces the idea upon us that says the Holy Spirit works directly upon you independent of the Bible because you're so depraved you can't even understand the Bible. 
is foreign to everything about this one chapter. Besides all the rest of the Bible concerning salvation. But this one chapter in the case of the conversion of Cornelius the centurion so long ago and kept in the divine volume to give us direction even today along with all the other cases of conversion. If you're not a child of God, surely if you've listened and you're honest like Cornelius, you know now what to do to be saved from your sins, to become a Christian, a member of the Lord's church. If as a child of God you sin, there is a second law of pardon. To be honest enough to realize you have to be, uh, have a heart that's tender, to be pricked, to know you've departed from living the Christian life in some aspect. you sinned as a Christian. You need to repent of those sins, come confessing them, and we'll pray with you and for you that God might forgive you and you once again be faithful to Him. If you're then subject to the great gospel call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.